inspiration, if it comes, doesn't last a very long time. If you can catch that inspiration, great. But then you have to do something with it. And that's skill and taste and patience. It doesn't make you a better or a worse artist to have to lean into that editing process is a fundamental part of what you're creating. That process of taking an idea, a flash of inspiration and crafting it into something is, I mean, it's, it's fun as much as anything else. Once you realize that that's not a failure to have to work on it. Hello, and welcome to episode 38 of Attention Engineer. Laura Kidd, a music producer, songwriter and solo artist making music as pen friend and beaming into your ears from my studio, The Launchpad in Bristol. Find me around the internet at Penfriend Rocks. Thanks for joining me today as I continue my mission to encourage creativity in every listener by sharing conversations with some of the artists I admire the most. Anniversaries are funny things, aren't they? An opportunity to reflect, to celebrate, to vow to do things differently, perhaps? This coming Thursday marks the fifth anniversary of the release of my third album, Direction of Travel, released under the name She Makes War in 2016. I actually don't have things like this marked in my calendar, though perhaps I should because I usually don't realise these anniversaries are on their way, and only remember, months later, way after any opportunity to reflect, celebrate or vow to do things differently. I did recently remember, just in time, the 13th anniversary of picking up my now fairly elderly pup, Mr Benji, so I was able to give him some extra cuddles that day. He, of course, didn't understand why. And he's got a point. What does it matter that my third album came out five years ago this Thursday? Since pretty much everything we engage with is our invention as humans, we get to decide what we feel is important. And I do think, especially during this super weird time, that marking anniversaries and birthdays and stuff like that just helps by giving us a defined moment to appreciate whatever that thing is. So I'm pleased I've remembered this particular anniversary in time to do something about it, though I'm not sure what that something will be quite yet. It's also coming up to the first anniversary of the launch of my Penfriend project and the Correspondence Club on the 1st of May 2020 and the launch of this podcast a month later on June the 3rd. And this is the second to last episode of this batch of 12. Since the launch, I've been experimenting with how to integrate the making of the podcast into my life as a music producer, recording artist and human. And with my new record coming out in just over six weeks, it feels like a good time to take a little breather, focus on that and get ready for another 12 week podcasting stint. Making and sharing stuff isn't about being a hero. And I've mentioned before my ongoing issues with burnout. But in the last 18 months, I've got so much more out of being really consistent with the things I make and do. And the priority for me is being able to continue doing the things I love that bring the most to others. It's heartwarming to know this podcast is one of those things. And I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who's got in touch over the past year to let me know that. Making things on your own in an attic room at the top of your house can be a strange thing. Sending bits of work out into the deafening silence of the world and just trying to keep going week after week after week. So yes, thank you for being out there listening and thank you for saying so. Speaking of fabulous people, this episode has a sponsor. I don't solicit these, as I've said before, because the independent spirit of this show is so important to me. But I do welcome sponsorship from listeners. And so today, a giant thank you goes to Louisa Mead, who wrote and said... This podcast is helping support independent music and other arts makers bring their passions into the public domain. Anything we can do to support them helps bring a more diverse and interesting menu of creative endeavours to us all. What a lovely way of summing it up. Thank you so much for those kind words, Louisa. And of course, for contributing to the making of this podcast. If you'd like to do the same, I've created a fresh new webpage at penfriend.rocks forward slash sponsorship with three easy ways to get involved at all levels. Thanks for considering it. Now, to today's guest. David and Peter Brewis have been releasing records as field music since 2005. 
The pair record at their own studio in Sunderland and have amassed a large and unwieldy catalogue which includes solo records, collaborations, a score for a silent documentary about the herring industry and a concept album about the aftermath of the First World War, as well as regular studio albums and occasional production work for other artists. David's third and most recent solo album as School of Language, 2019's 45, imagined the rise of Donald Trump as a funk musical. Field Music's new album, Flat White Moon, arrives in the world on the 23rd of April, 2021. In this conversation, we discuss the importance of sharing our experiences to help younger artists have the encouragement we didn't get ourselves, being prepared for the highs and lows of releasing albums, actually planning it in, how learning to do everything yourself can be faster than explaining what you want to someone else, the futility of playing support slots, even if they're with your favourite bands, and why you don't go to see field music for a good night out. Here we go. How are you doing? I'm all right, thank you. Yeah, I'm good. Just um, had a bit of a tweety morning, which is uh, kind of, is, it, is there any point? Probably not, but sometimes there is. <laughs> Sometimes you just need to say some things. Sometimes, so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I empathise entirely with that. How are you? I'm doing all right. Would you like to tell me and also the people listening to this who you are? I am David Brewis and with my brother Peter, uh, we've been making records under the name Field Music since uh, 2004, 2005. We've also made some collaborative records and solo records and have just generally been very busy making music since then. Yeah. Lots and lots and lots of songs. Yeah. Loads of them. How many? Do you keep track? Um, not as many songs as the Beatles wrote in their eight years, I think. Oh, really? I, th- I think they wrote like 200 songs in that period. Did they really? And I, I'm, we're not there yet. I didn't know that fact. Well, I mean, one of the ways we learned to play was from the complete Beatles chord book. Yeah. And, you know, you're like, oh, page 203, really? (laughs) There you go. I try and keep a bit of a track. I hadn't really planned who I was trying to catch up to or anything. I I do sort of keep a track. Be like, okay, I've probably published maybe 70, 80 songs, which feels like a lot. But it's not really, not it's not 200, is it? So I've got a way to go. You need to release two albums a year, basically. That's, I think that's how they did it. Ah, uh, yeah, I suppose so. It's a question that actually my son has asked me, and that's why I've had to think about it. It's like, how many songs have you written, Dad? Oh, uh, really? So how old's your son? Is he interested in music? He's interested in singing along to Party Man by Prince from the Batman soundtrack. Uh, <laughs> that's cool. He's, he's <laughs> six. Oh, okay, that's cute. And they, you know, they love, they love listening to music and dancing around. Um, yeah. And my daughter's four and mm. she, she comes up with a lot of songs. They're quite long, very narrative heavy, quite often feature unicorns or sad princesses. <laughs> um, I didn't even start learning to play guitar until I was 10. So there's been no like, mm. you must learn an instrument now from me. So it's like, yeah. nah, they're kids. They have no patience for anything. Yeah. Let alone like the pain you have to go through when you're trying to hold an A chord down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I started playing violin when I was seven. And, I, and when I think about that now, it just seems so bonkers that this little child was holding a violin and making a horrible soaring sound. <laughs> and people were encouraging that behavior. <laughs> Can't have sounded any good. I mean, I've I've kind of feel that that's definitely the way it goes with um with violin, especially where like it takes a long time to get good at intonation. So you have to start. Yeah. You have to start horrible, basically. You have to start hard for a lot of years. It would be so bad. <laughs> it's a shame it has to be audible, really, because you could really just get on with it without people having to suffer. But yeah, people really encouraged me to do that for quite a few years. It never really went anywhere. <laughs> there you go. Your new album, Flat White Moon, is out on April the 21st, which is brilliant timing for this podcast because I think this is going to go out a couple of weeks beforehand. Yeah. It's almost like I planned it, but I didn't. But I did <laughs> to help you. Of course you did. Thank you very much. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. This is a key part of your marketing strategy, as I can tell. Yeah. But um, how are you feeling about the album coming out, especially like with what's going on in the world at the moment and all that? Um, I mean, probably a little bit detached from it. 
because um, there's probably mm. been a slightly longer gap between us finishing the record and it coming out than, than we usually have. Mm. And a little bit, as always, a little bit anxious about, are people going to like this? Does this album make any sense? We have, we've got no perspective on it whatsoever. And a little bit anxious that like, oh yeah, we, you know, we're going to do a live stream and we, we don't know how to play any of these songs. And in a lot of cases, the one day we played this guitar part was a full year ago and nobody's thought about this guitar part since that one day. Yeah. Yeah. And now we need to figure out how to play it. So a mix of feelings. And then, you know, come the day it it's actually released, there'll be a bit of a sigh of relief and a little bit of deflation, which I think that's that feels yeah. like the normal normal release schedule for me. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Does it ever get easier? Because you've you have put out so it's, this is the eighth field music album, I think, isn't it? But you've also done several of your own solo thing. The the highs and lows emotionally of doing it are the same. Mm. Yeah. I think. Um but you are just ready for them. You know, I'm right. I'm ready for that feeling of deflation. I'm, <laughs> yes. I'm ready to not notice like five nice reviews in favour of the one <laughs> negative review, which I feel really annoyed about. And she's like, you haven't got it. You didn't understand. You've judged it on a completely yeah. different scale. That's not what we were doing. I know yeah. those feelings are coming because that's happened a lot. Right. And that just makes it easier to cope with, even though actually those emotional highs and lows are pretty much the same. There's less at stake because... Yeah this isn't going to be the only album we ever make. And the the pressure you put on yourself when you release your first record or your first couple of records is too much. And occasionally, you know, I'll speak to a, you know, a young band or a young songwriter and say, just finish them and get it out because if these songs that you feel very precious about, if these are the best songs you're ever going to write that's an issue yes these aren't the best songs you're ever going to write release them your next song should be better your next songs are going to be better than this mm. so be excited about those ones because because we waited around like a long time before before we made our first album um we kind of had our first brushes with the music industry when i was 18 19 mm. 1999 and we didn't get round to making the first field music record until 2004. In those years of flailing around, I probably wrote 15 songs. Right. But like couldn't move on until people knew they were in the world. And actually, I'm not going to say it was wasted time, but it was time when I mm. felt pretty bad about myself and my ability to do this. Whereas mm. now I'm at least in a position where it's like, okay, I've written these songs. I like them. I feel good about them. I don't have proper perspective on them. I fully intend for my next song to be different and better than this. Yeah. That's a lovely way of looking at it. What did those years of flailing consist of then? Why, why weren't you able to just record them and put them out? What was stopping you or what was the sort of goal? Um, there were various things going on. For one, me and Peter having to figure out, like, can we work together and how do we do that? Mm. Yeah. So for a lot of that period, we actually did separate bands mm. because we could not share control. <laughs> <laughs> so we had two separate bands and, you know, my band had was a three piece and we were going to, you know, be nimble. And Peter's band was a seven piece and it was going to be, you know, orchestral and intricate. And we didn't have the skills to produce a record ourselves. Mm -hmm. But also we had such a specific idea of what we wanted to do that we couldn't find anyone to guide us through it. You know, so we was like, okay, well, we've, we've made these recordings. We should go and record them properly. You go to a studio and record them properly. That's not what I wanted. That's not, that, that doesn't sound right. Maybe we should record them ourselves and then get someone to mix them. You record them yourselves. Give it to someone to mix. Take it away. 
this mix isn't right. We should have mixed it ourselves. Next time you record them yourself, you mix them yourself. But mastering will make it sound like a real record. <laughs> Someone masters it. Ah, uh, it still doesn't sound like a real record. So it's all like this like learning process of us getting better at recording things and trying to represent our ideas. But I think what, what we've yeah. always found is that we can learn those skills faster than we can explain to someone else exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. I love that. You you must have been through a similar Yes, process. that's why I'm laughing so much. So I, the thing is, obviously, we've just met. So I, I, I appreciate it. I just seem like, why is this woman smiling so much and nodding so emphatically? It's because it's, it's just, it's actually just so wonderful. Firstly, to hear someone being just as childish as I am about reviews, because we're <laughs> all the same. And I just honestly, like, I... I don't get many anyway. That's one of my beefs is I'm not going to get any anyway for mine. I'm putting out album five in May. And so I love the fact that you're prepared for your ups and downs. And, 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 and as you were saying that, I was thinking, yes, why don't I just plan in a day, probably the day of the release and after the release to just be really depressed. Just yeah, plan it yeah, in, yeah. get some nice chocolates in, get my nicest pajamas. Maybe Hell, do you know what? I might buy some new ones, get some fluffy socks, plan out my, you know, Netflix watching, whatever. Just something, instead of pretending it's going to be different, let's just be adults and appreciate that is part of it. You are very wise and stealing that. So that's one of the things. Thank and the you. other thing about, <laughs> thank you. And the other thing about, yeah, um, the flailing around. Yeah, I did that for years and years and years. And I think it was because, I don't know if it's in the water or something, but it's like, it's like the world's telling you, yeah, sure, you could write a song, but you probably can't record it. And if you can record it, you probably won't do it as well as that guy over there. And actually, if you spend a lot of money, it's going to be better quality and that's what you should do and then once you've done all that and done it in the right ways hiring all of these people you know you're supposed to love it and I you know I'm proud of the I'm proud of the early work I did where I was co-producing with someone because I'm not yeah I would never disassociate myself from the stuff I've made I, I would never have re bothered releasing it because it's all independent I would never have gone to all that fuss if unless I really was pleased with it at the time I can hear the progression in my work, obviously, and I'm sure others can too. But yeah, I've, def I've got to the point where I'm now recording everything in this room myself. I know I can do it. I know it's not that hard to do it either. It's kind of made out to be this dark art. And I always do caveat that with the fact that some people go and learn how to do this properly and they're really very very skilled and talented and you know that's wonderful if you can work with those people and they will be the right people for you that's wonderful but I love recording myself I love home recording so I'm just I, I hear all the things you're saying and I agree and I think it's great that that journey took you to a place where yeah and now you can make albums cheaply and regularly and keep giving your audience more music because surely that, I mean, that's what it's all about. And be able to do one a year is such a nice, I mean, that's that's a goal for me. But there's so much fuss <laughs> around actually releasing the thing. I'm not sure I could do all of that every year. So how do you find that? But I mean, you're not alone in this. So there are people helping. Well, we're very lucky that early on in the process, we we found the label who were right for us, who were just very tolerant of our whims um, <laughs> and didn't try and present the music industry as being something that it's not. Um, so we've just got that lovely relationship where they do this really hard bit of work, which I don't enjoy. Yeah. Um, they, you know, they know everyone at every independent record shop. They know the, the, the distributors, they know the process of getting stuff pressed. Uh, they, they know how to deal with getting songs to radio and getting albums reviewed. And then we have to worry about that all a lot less. And that is a relief. Um, yeah. When we'd recorded our first album, so this is like summer 2004, by that time, you know, we'd already met quite a few people in the music industry, um, some of whom were clearly awful, mm. some of whom were clearly nice, but very wrapped up in the hype and excitement of it. 
and some of whom were clearly nice, but quite grumpy and under no illusions. <laughs> when we'd finished the record, we sent it to the people who were grumpy and said, <laughs> we've been waiting around to like do a record for a long time. Mm. We've done this. We're ready to put it out. Before we do it ourselves, we like you. Oh, would you be interested in doing it? Mm. And Matt and Ollie from Memphis Industries were the only people to get back to us. And what a fortuitous thing that was, because now, you know, mm. we've been with that label for 17 years. Wow. But I suppose like one of the things which has changed for us, along with all of these like, expectations, is that my focus is not on the release. My focus is on... Mm the bit that I really like, which is writing songs, recording them, rehearsing with the band. Not not the day the album comes out. Yeah, that's good. It's a part of a job I have to deal with. But um, the more I focus on that side of it, the more down and um, lacking in control I feel. Yeah, that's a very interesting word to use, yeah. Because there's so much outside of our control as artists and, well, people as humans. And it's so easy to focus on the things that we can't control and get worried about those things and get down about those things. Yeah, absolutely. We talk about that a lot in this house, actually, my husband and I, about, you know, am I stressed out? And not just me, but him also. So are we are we getting stressed out about our work? Um, in a way that's productive in that, you know, is, is it worth it? Are we getting stressed out about the aspects that we can do anything about? We help each other out by having a conversation. I go, okay, well, which things can you do something about and which things can't you? Cause you just have to try to let those other things go. And it's not so simple, but you just have to, especially with the world as it is, you know, there's so much outside of our control. So um, yeah, I like to have things that are in my control that are things that I'm making. So this podcast, my songs and things like that. Um, Putting the record out is under my control as well, unfortunately. I have to do that too. But, you know, I can deal with all of that. And then it's just so, like you were saying earlier, the reviews that, I don't know if, if you meant it this way, but for me, it's the reviews that go, oh, clearly she was trying to sound like this or clearly influenced by blah, blah, thing I've never heard of. It's that stuff that makes me irritated. I mean, I, I try not to get too annoyed about that. Um, mm. There are bands that we get... But- compared to all the time that I, I it's not that I don't like them but I'm just like I'm not interested in that kind of thing yeah and I think what I what I try and hold in my mind is that whatever someone compares your music to it's like 80 percent what they have heard and 20 percent what you have done yes yes the frustration is that as a reader you don't have to deal with that you don't have to deal with that this like skewed ratio and it's not until you've made something and put it out there it's like I don't listen to Steely Dan I don't know anything (laughs) about Steely Dan I've heard (laughs) that any major dude song I like that one that's a good one Ricky don't lose Mm. that that number that's a good song I'm not Mm. interested in that yeah so that people would talk about that means that they like Steely Dan or don't like Steely Dan yes and they've applied that to the 20% of what they hear and what you've done yeah I try not to get annoyed about it. Sometimes I I probably do. Well, it's pointless, isn't it? Yeah, that's the thing. It is so pointless, but I'm just glad that you're admitting it a bit because like, as I said, I feel like that's a quite a childish aspect of my personality where I'm just kind of like stamping on the floor going, but I don't sound anything like that. <laughs> so annoying. I mean, I, I'm I'm envious of anyone who, who can genuinely say, oh, I, I don't read the reviews. I, I'm because, because <laughs> I, a lie. Cause I, I, I do. And, you know, mm. like, the the bit of the release that's important is knowing that it's out there and that maybe it connects with people and the yes. reviews are a way of finding finding out whether whether that is is happening um yeah so i don't feel like i can just like no i i do i don't need the reviews i don't care about i made it for me uh, yeah right <laughs> the making was for me the releasing mm, yes is not for me I mean, other than that's like, like kind of my job, but like that's the releasing is to give it to other people. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not able to be that mature, and I, <laughs> I 
I don't care what you all think. I achieved my <laughs> dreams. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I do care what people think. I don't I don't care. I don't care what reviewers think in the sense that I'm trying to reach people who aren't reviewers. I'm trying to reach music fans, right? But the, the, the thing that irks me about the reviewer part of it, when when they get it wrong, inverted commas, in my own brain, is just because I want I want my thing to be communicated in the way that I want to the music yeah. fans. And so if the, if the conduit of that is the music reviewer and they're totally not getting me, then they're not going to communicate that in the way that they should, should to the people who are listening and then it drives me crazy because I'm trying to reach them. And obviously you want reviews to reach more people. So yeah, anyway, it's one of those things, isn't it? Poor us doing the thing we love, <laughs> having people write about it. Jesus. Um, <laughs> I may cut this bit down so I don't sound so petulant. <laughs> but anyway, we'll see. <laughs> I actually asked you about your album. I'd love to talk about your new album. Of course, I'm a big, big coffee fan. So I was like, oh, flat white moon. Oh, moon. Okay. So <laughs> were you trying to make a combination of, of a drink plus something to do with space? Or is there more to it than that? Um, Quite often when we can't think of a phrase that sums up the music we've made, we come up with a phrase which sums up the artwork. And the moon on the artwork of the album is a cup of coffee from um, from a cafe which closed a couple of years ago and is like the kind of nostalgic heart of Sunderland for us, a place called Louis. Uh. They would not have called it a flat white. In Louis, a coffee means really strong espresso mixed with frothed milk. That's just what a coffee is. If you want a black coffee, you have to specifically say, black coffee, please. Yeah. Put the jug right. of foamed milk away. Um, <laughs> so the flat white moon is, if you have a, if you check out the, the cover image, the, the moon on there is actually a picture of a cup of coffee. Brilliant. I love that. So it wasn't. I wasn't so off with the flat white thing. That's good. No, no, and and like it, it is. It's relevant to us. It's not solely us being silly. Um, but yeah, it was a. It's it's a coffee. It's a coffee moon. Nice. Um, I'm glad you said the word silly because now I feel like I can ask you. Do you consider yourself to be quite a silly person? I do. I do consider myself to be quite a silly person. Um, we came up with this theory early on that. We should not take ourselves seriously and we should take our music very seriously. And I think we have mostly managed to keep keep going with that. Um, we don't make silly music. I, th I would hope that some of our sense of humour comes across in the music we've made, some of the music we've made. Mm. Um, but I feel no need to present myself as a serious artist. The serious ideas I have, I put into the music... The silly ideas, that's that's just that's just me. Yeah. Well, I'm having listened to your music a lot, I, I definitely get that sense. And so I don't mean silly because your music's silly, because it's definitely not. And I don't think that any silliness that comes across in videos and things undermines the music either. Because I think that that we have to be careful not to do that. Because I'm I'm really silly. And I, I wouldn't want people to just dismiss my music because I'm a silly person, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think we have crossed the line occasionally with the videos and that I've, I think that is, says something about how we feel about or have felt about making videos. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, ideally we would be much better at making videos and would have loads of ideas for what we were going to do and, and be able to do lots of videos, which are like a perfect encapsulation of what we're trying to do musically. Mm -hmm. We haven't often managed to do that. So instead, I would hope that our sense of humour as people... And our aesthetic style mm. comes across to, to a degree from the videos. But I mean, as a, as a person, I'm just absolutely daft. <laughs> it's good to know. It must be handy having two little kids as well to be a daft person. I wasn't so daft, actually. No? I was considerably less daft before I had kids. And then I just had to chuck all of the semblance of seriousness away. <laughs> um, yeah. it's, I, can't, I can't be cool. I'll never be cool. I'm too old and I have two ridiculous children. <laughs> You're going to get them in the band soon. Sound like that could be a good addition. My son always already thinks he's in the band. Um, we did it. <laughs> we did a, 
a matinee show at a, at the Clooney in Newcastle, um, and he swiped a shaky egg, stood on the balcony, and was playing through the songs and heckling me in between. I thought, how am I going to cope with this? <laughs> so I gave him instruction, some instructions of how to play the next song, which he followed quite well, but now he thinks he's in the band. Then he asks every now and again, do people still talk about that time I played with the band, Daddy? Um, <laughs> and actually, they talk more about the heckling, but but yeah, yeah, they do. That's good. Dad, when we're getting in the van again? Yeah, yeah just like... I, I, <laughs> I, I am kind of in the band now, though, aren't I? I've booked some time off school. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh. oh. How are you feeling about um, post-album stuff this year? Because obviously in normal times, oh, it's such a weird thing to say, but in normal times, there would probably be a tour. So um, I'm really interested in what other people are doing with, obviously, because I'm putting a record out too, like ways to kind of, extend the release in some way or to create some you know excitement or to keep it rolling so more and more people can hear about your record because it's not just in the weeks preceding the album that you're trying to get people into it it's obviously when it comes out do you have any thoughts about that um it's difficult isn't it um so we i mean we we have a, a tour booked for october um we booked it a long time ago and it seems possible yeah if not probable. And I think anyone who's buying gig tickets now and anyone who's booking tours is doing it on the proviso that this might not happen in the way that is yeah. planned. But it very much might. It's, it's looking like it could. At least with October, it seems like yes. it's possible. We're not, you know, we're not, yeah. we're not, we're not pushing things too far. We're not really going out of the box here. Um, and it is so strange with that, um, where the focus of the release is because if you if a record is going to be on spotify um you can't really do a single after the album has come out no spotify won't promote it as a new release because it's already there on the album yeah um so that yeah a great deal of the focus is beforehand um i mean at the moment because we produce so much stuff and because we spent a year saying yes to everything it's like we might not be able, we might not be able to do this job anymore unless we do some work so a lot of the things which people have suggested to us like would you like to curate an exhibition yes of course we would <laughs> in previous years we might have been able to legitimately say we don't really have time for that this year yeah. yes okay we'll do that so <laughs> we have a pretty busy schedule of other things Mm. a mix of commissions and community projects um we also have a certain amount of music that we didn't put on the album where it's like okay well maybe maybe we do that as a little extra release like around Mm. the the tour we we might not we haven't made a a clear plan but i mean I've got songs that I need to write. I've got arrangements that I need to do. Mm-hmm. We've got music in the can. <laughs> I mean, we've also got things like we've we recorded like uh, three live shows that we were going to make into a live album. We could still do that if I ever have time to actually mix that many tracks. Yeah. So to a certain extent for me, outside of that tour, it's like, well, the album's out there. Maybe people will find it. It might take people two years to find it, but I'm going to be mm. busy doing other things because I need to. Yeah. I need to write a song about the Marquis of London, Derry. I've, <laughs> actually, I've actually already written the song about the Marquis of London, Derry, <laughs> but I cool. I have other songs yeah. to to yeah. write in that vein. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, it's just that like I can't do anything about the release now, and yeah. If I'm going to be uh, happy as a person, I need to focus on the creating the next things. And yeah. to a certain extent, yeah, that sadly means I have to like wave goodbye to this album, which we might never play. Hopefully we will, but you know, we mm. maybe we'll never play those songs. But that's 
for me, that seems like the most sensible way of, of coping with it. And it does just mean mm. like letting these things go. But I suppose like you've made all those albums. We've made a lot of albums. There's lots of songs we've never, ever played live and we never oh, yeah. will. Yeah. Um, and then there's another like 30 songs we've played once or twice and then realized this doesn't work live and never played them again. And for for me, once you stop being precious, like everybody needs to everybody needs to feel this way about about a particular song, the way that I feel about it. You can't make that happen. So instead it's just like, well, I did that song the way I wanted to do. And now it gets filed away in the songs I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And move on. Maybe that that's not a great way to do it. Maybe I'm like selling some of those songs short, but it just feels like that's the only way to keep myself sane and not be worried about, you know, worried about those things I can't do anything about. Yeah. I think that sounds incredibly wise again. That's why I'm I'm just being, I'm sort of sitting back and going, yeah, absolutely. Because an album doesn't only exist if you get to play it to loads of people. Lots of brilliant music gets made and doesn't get toured. Touring is a whole nother massive conversation about, you know, I talk about this all the time, of course, with my husband, we're talking about like, what would we do differently or what will we do differently when things are possible again? You know, I'm not going to be driving myself um, four or five hours to play a, a support slot for no money to people who aren't that bothered. That That's really insanity. If you really think about it, I was making the analogy the other day. If I made vases, I don't make vases. If I made vases and I was trying to sell the vases, would I pack the car up with all my vases and drive to some random place <laughs> to put my vases next to someone else's vases? And people are only there. Vases doesn't sound like a word anymore, does it? People have only gone to that place because they really like this other person's vases. But I'm just there going, but look at my ones. And they're like, no, I'm not, not that arsed. I've come to see these vases. And I'm like, but I've traveled all this way. And then they're just talking and talking that's <laughs> and a, getting drunk. That's a brilliant analogy. <laughs> but would, would, would I do that if I was a vase seller? I don't think so. I don't think I would. <laughs> I mean, I think it is a, it's a good analogy. <laughs> it's not a perfect analogy, but it, it works a bit. But how bands at all levels deal with support slots is maybe not talked enough about. Um, no. I mean, we basically don't do any support slots now. Mm -hmm. The last one we did, I think we were playing, yeah, we played with Elbow at um, underneath the the massive satellite dish at Jodrell Bank. Wow. And it was huge. And, you know, there were probably a hundred people there who might not have heard of us who enjoyed it. Mm. But in order to play it to those hundred people, we were playing to another nine thousand people mm. who wanted Guy Garvey. It's understandable. That's okay. Yeah, that's what that's what they paid for. But it's how much like torment do you want to go through to reach those hundred people? Yeah. And maybe if you're if you're young and confident and going for it, maybe you can do that. Yeah, I did it for years. Yeah. So many people do, and, and like, and you feel like you have to. You have to go through that that period. I mean, certainly when we choose support bands now, there's a real sense of will this band, this artist, be able to win over the audience who comes to our shows? Yeah. That's why. Yeah. That's why it'll be worth it for them. Yeah, you're giving them a chance. I feel like we know our audience quite well and actually they're very open to lots of different things. Mm -hmm. And you kind of want to find that balance of like challenging them with something they might not have heard. But like, if you, if you go for this, you are really going to like these. Yeah. Um, and occasionally that's worked really, really well. Um, we, we took steel and sheep out on tour. It's like, it's nearly 10 years ago now. And you know, they, I think they really surprised people at those venues who maybe hadn't heard of them, but they put on a great show, great singers, great musicians. 
really interesting songs and a really interesting conception. It's just like, oh yeah, that, that was perfect. Like it made us look cool because Steel and Sheep are quite cool, but also mm. that was worthwhile for them to do these gigs for like crappy money. Yeah. But because they they won over this like this decent chunk of of the people who might have gone to our shows. Yeah, and that's that's the sort of dream of it. <clears throat> I think when you're starting out, it, everything just feels like, oh, I am so lucky to get to go and play my music. And and there is an element of that. But once it becomes your, you know, dare I say it, creative business or job, not to take the magic out of the thing, but it, it becomes a thing that you do. It's not the thing you, you do, you've done a few times and it's super exciting. It's a thing you do and you have to figure out, well, wh- what is what is the value of this? And the value doesn't always have to be it almost certainly isn't money, numbers or things. It's it's uh, it's in other places. It's in the wonderful conversations you have with people after you've played and things like that. But it's also in, do I do have to drive back from London to Bristol at 1am feeling not great? You know, Reading services, oh, oh I miss you so, you know, <laughs> all of that sort of thing. It does come into it and it's people, I don't know, people don't love to talk about that. And then there's definitely an attitude of some audience members, I think, like, well, win me over then. But I can't win you over if you're talking the entire time. I really, there's nothing I could do. I could be the best performer in the universe, and you, you're not even giving me a chance. So there's a lot of that in my mind about you know returning to gigs whenever that that is possible to happen. Um, but just I love that you are thinking about that from the perspective of the headline band because from the support band side, yeah, you do have to think: is are these people who are in the audience going to like me? Not just do I love the band who have invited me? Because I've had that before. I, I played with Suede. Suede's audience do not care for my kind of music, but I just thought I love Suede. So of course I want to play with Suede, you know, and several other um, bigger artists as well. uh, And I've got to play with them, but then you very quickly learn, oh, just because I love this band doesn't mean that the people who love the band are going to love me. It's totally different. It it is. It's such a trick, such a tricky one. And I mean, it's another one where I think we have been really lucky and because we've made so many abrupt turns in our career is that mm. we have developed this audience who are just like, yeah, I quite, I quite like going to see a band who might make an abrupt turn and do something weird. I, yeah. um, we're in this nice position where we've got this really lovely audience who are interested in things outside of us. Um, mm. we, we don't get that. Like I'm only here to see field music. And I don't want to see nothing else, <laughs> which yeah, like, good. just like standing right at the front board. <laughs> yeah. I have to be at the front, you know, because I need to see the band, but that just means that I'm just going to stare like this. Oh, at the they're the band. worst ones. Oh God. That's what you want to see when you walk out on stage, feeling nervous to support one of your favorite bands, those people. And oh. so like, <laughs> By accident or by design, we mm. we we don't have those people at our gigs. Yeah, maybe that's, that's to do with the level that we're we're at. You know, if we can fill a two hundred or three hundred or four hundred capacity venue in most places around most cities around the UK, yeah, they're like they're all people who are really into it. That's yeah. that's not that's not casual fans who know you one song that's been on the radio yeah yeah i think that probably after you get to the 800 1000 capacity venue stage i don't think it's possible just to have those like i'm really into into this i really love all those weird career twists they've made you don't get those people the proportion of that goes down and certainly that i mean in in the early years, around the time of our first couple of albums, when when we did do occasional support tours, that that's what we found. You know, so we we toured with our mates. We toured with Maximal Park, and we toured with the Futureheads, and they were both playing like big venues. Certainly on the the Futureheads tour, which was in two thousand and six, and they were playing fifteen hundred to two thousand capacity venues. Mm. Um. There was a decent chunk of those people who were just there for hands of love. And I was so annoyed with them. I was annoyed with the, the audience because it's like, don't you understand how good this band are? Don't, yeah. don't you get it? 
why are you here? Go away. Stop talking. <laughs> and it's like my possessiveness over, you know, my friend's band and their music mm. um, made me very intolerant of a certain <laughs> section of that crowd. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the talking section of the crowd are the ones I, I dislike. Because fundamentally, right? I don't know. I don't know why it's so difficult for people to get on board with this. We're the ones who are making the sounds that you've paid to watch. <laughs> I can't understand. And I'm talking about people who talk the entire time, really loudly, shouting to their mates all the way through, and not just through me, the support band they've never heard, but then all the way through the headliner, who they have heard, who they have paid to see. I don't understand it. I think it's the difference between like wanting to be in the audience for music or wanting to have a night out. Um, and again, yes. it's like, if you want a good night out on the lash, you don't go and see field music unless you're in Glasgow. Actually we have, <laughs> there's a crossover there where, right. you know, some of the people who really, really want to be in, in like in the music also need to have six or seven pints. Right. And it's, so it's just different. It's just different in Glasgow. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, we're, we're lucky that we, we don't, we don't have those. We don't, you don't, you know, come and see us for a good night out. For a good chat. No way. <laughs> We're not entertaining. <laughs> There's no entertainment here. <laughs> oh, this is ser this is serious. This is serious stuff. <laughs> Engage your brain. There's a lot of notes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Put your pint down and let's let's chat about chords. <laughs> I love the way you're, I don't know if it's the most recent video now, sorry, if you've, if you've put several more out since I saw it a few weeks ago, but the one where the instructional video. I mean, that, the, I think we might have taken it too far with the, um, <laughs> taking, a, taking a piss out of our own style. Um, <laughs> uh, it, I mean, we are also the kind of band where people ask like, oh, I really like that musical bit, or I really like what you did there, or it's clever. Mm -hmm. And um you know, people like our productions. They want to talk about our drum sounds. Everyone wants to talk about our drum sounds. Mm. Um, so we kind of lent into that in a in a comical way. I mean, actually, there's a lot of outtakes from that video, which which yeah. lay open the process even more, in even more <laughs> detail and in an even more comical way. Um, mm. Maybe we'll have to do like a twenty minute edit. Um, oh, please do. I'm happy to like find the humor in that process. And mm. also, you know, some people will say, don't talk about how you do things. Like you spoil the mystery. I could literally talk to you all day for weeks. You could sit in the studio with us for weeks watching what we did and we could tell you everything we were doing. We could tell you every thought we had, every process and neither you nor I would still understand how you do it. The mystery is, <laughs> no. mystery doesn't work like that. Mystery is mysterious. Mystery, mystery can't be torn apart in that way. It's much more robust than that. Yeah, We don't know all of the psychological factors that go into how you've combined everything you've ever heard and all of the ideas you've had, all the things you're angry about or love how you roll those up and turn them into a piano part. I can tell you what I think, what was like at the, at the top of my brain in that process. Yeah. But it, if there's any magic there, that what I say will not, will not help you find the magic. <laughs> yeah. That's such a beautiful way of putting it. That makes me think, wouldn't it be interesting to do a field music challenge where everyone has to write a song as if they were field music, because you've basically told them how. I'm ready for that, and some people have 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 <laughs> like said, I, "I've done this song, and it's I think it's a bit like a field music song." Oh. Ah, cool. But then, am I allowed to tell people when they've got it wrong, or would that just be cruel? <laughs> Let's just do the review, <laughs> the mean review. We would never use that kind of chord. <laughs> we don't use hi hats in that way. No. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not. I think encouraging people's creativity is is definitely something I'm more into. I love the idea of, and it's something I'm really into trying to do myself, of whatever experience I have, just trying to share that with people because it that's how I've learned everything. 
I didn't learn it off the teachers at school and I didn't learn it off anyone I worked with um, in, in office jobs and things in my 20s. I learned it from other musicians, from YouTube videos, from listening to lots of music and through trying and trying and trying and trying and writing and writing and writing and doing all the things, re- repeating them again and again. That's how I've learned. And so if anything I can say to someone will give them even the tiniest shortcut or the tiniest boost of encouragement, then I'm all about that at the moment. It's been something I've been really focused on for the last couple of years. And that's why this podcast exists as well. So it's lovely to hear you saying that because I, I don't think you can over explain the process so that it's boring because it's not boring. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing that none of us understand, but we're able to do it somehow. And just sort of, I, I have such a respect for that magic, but I also want other people to experience that magic. So it's just giving them tools to try, I think. Yeah, ab- Absolutely. My wife runs a, a project for young musicians in Sunderland, um, and occasionally they they'll come and either rehearse or like work on their songs in our studio. And for me, that is very much a chance for for me to help them with the kind of guidance that I wish we we had occasionally had through those years of flailing, because the. Yeah. We live in a place with very little arts infrastructure. And in mm-hmm. a way that's been useful because it has encouraged like an independence of spirit for us. If you want to mm-hmm. do something, you've just got to do it yourself because there's no there's nowhere else to do it. Um yeah. but that's not a good formula for how to help people. It's like, ah, you don't need anything. Just do it all yourself. <laughs> It might take yeah. you five times as long, <laughs> yeah. but you'll learn independence of spirit and that's great. <laughs> yeah. And actually what we should be doing yeah. instead of saying, oh, well, you could try this or I'll help you do this. Or if you want to record that song, you could do it this way or this way or that way, but you get to, you choose. Mm-hmm. You can still foster that independence of spirit without having to be a cultural wasteland. Um, yes. <laughs> there's, no, there's no magic to living in a cultural wasteland. Um, no. Well, it shouldn't have to be as hard for everybody else as it was for us, just because it was hard. No, that's silly. No. <laughs> Let's help each other. No, give give people the chance to get a few steps further on than you a couple of years earlier than than we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. The fact that YouTube has everything on it that you could possibly want to learn doesn't mean that um, it's it's easy because you still need to know what you need to learn or you you have to know where you want to go and and not even know where you want to go, but believe you could get there. And so I think that is so important, like to, to, to demonstrate that it's possible in the first place. Like even if I'd had someone say to me in like 2006, when I was starting to try and write my own music, you can do this, Laura. Just, just keep going. You'll get there. No one said anything like that to me, probably, because I never told them I was doing it because I was so petrified that people would say I was crap. So I could just, yeah, just just those words of encouragement. They're so powerful. Yeah, even that just like, hey, that, that song, that's that's good. You should do you should do more of them. Um yeah. even just that can be all it takes. I remember my brother saying to me when we were kids. When we were teenagers, he's five years older than me. And he said to me, oh yeah, you've got a good voice. I honestly thought he was taking the piss. <laughs> I thought, I assumed he was taking the piss. And I was like, yeah, yeah, right, whatever. <laughs> and then, you know, 15 years later or something. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, I can sing, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, a bit more encouragement, please, everyone. That'd be nice. <laughs> yeah. And I, I won't do really harsh critiques of anyone's uh, attempts at a field music parody. It'll be very encouraging. Yeah, that'd be a bit mean, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. But then I don't know. I, I think there's a there's a fine line, isn't there, between just telling someone they're they're amazing, and offering a bit of helpful, you know, criticism. Not to be critical, but to. I think there's some problems with people thinking they're amazing without any nuance and any kind of. Humility. <laughs> Constructive criticism is is a good thing. And you just have to be careful with it, especially if you like like my wife does, working with young people who feel very, very sensitive yeah. about yes. you know, putting things out there, putting their ideas out there, their voice, yeah. their voices or their guitar playing. They'll yeah. say before they play something, I can't really play the guitar and I can't really sing. And the lyrics are terrible. Um so like any criticism of that has to be, you have to be really careful that 
that what they take from it is these are things I'm good at and these are things I can I could get better at and it's not a problem that I'm not finished yet yeah but I think then that ties back to the idea of, of discussing the process of things because only by showing that there is a process can you show that it takes some work so you know especially young people, if they're writing songs and they think they suck and maybe they do, and maybe they're not coming out very easily all in one go, you know, because they don't, that's not normally how songs are written, then they think they're not doing it right. So I remember, again, at school, I was trying to write an essay or some, some English essay and I couldn't get the first line right. So I just was stuck on the first line. And I, my, my English teacher, who wasn't particularly nice to me, I must say, she gave me some of the best advice I've ever had, which is writing is editing. You can't edit it if it's not there. You just have to write some stuff. It doesn't come out perfectly as as it will be in the end. And so, yeah, knowing that there is a process at all is a helpful start. Yeah, I mean, inspiration, if it comes, doesn't last a very long time. If you can catch that inspiration, great. But then you have to do something with it. And that's skill and taste and patience to, to do the editing process. If you don't have to do any of the editing process, hey, great. But like, it doesn't make you a better or a worse artist to have to lean into that editing process is a fundamental part of what you're creating. Inspiration is overrated. And when people say like, oh yeah, I wrote this song in like 15 seconds. It's like, well, hey, maybe you did. And that's fine if you can do one like that. But that is also like not a formula for how to write good songs. It's not good. No. If you wrote it in 15 seconds, I mean, you know, Leonard Cohen would spend like 20 years <laughs> refining the lyrics for one song. That process of taking an idea, a flash of inspiration and crafting it into something is, I mean, it's, it's fun as much as anything else. Once you realize that that's not a failure to have to work on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's no point having success that you can't replicate. And when I say success, I mean, like the completion of a song, not not the reception of a song, but the complete. So I completed a song and, it, and some of mine have taken 15 minutes, probably three or four out of however many I've done. Um, but that was the kind of inspiration finds you working thing. I was sitting there with the guitar or the whatever the instrument and I, I wrote something. Um, but yeah, if I can't replicate that, then I'm still no good at my job. I'm not a songwriter if I can't do it again and again and again. So, yeah. I mean, there were plenty of times like early on where I just felt like I was a, where I was a total failure because I couldn't, I couldn't make it happen like that. Like, oh, I can't, that, uh, mm. that flash of inspiration isn't here. I will never write anything again. I never knew what I was doing anyway. I, I'm a failure. I'm terrible at this. And once you realize that you have to get yourself into the right sphere to receive the inspiration. And then mm. you have to acknowledge that it might be a very tiny kernel or it might be quite a large idea. Whatever you end up with, you then work and refine and use everything your brain has got to make it into the best thing it can be. And mm. all of those things are necessary to one degree or another having to do them does not mean you are failing just because the inspiration didn't do it all for you. Yeah. It means you're working. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with working. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but even, even now five albums in, it's not very many albums, but, but you know, several albums in when I'm writing something new, I still think it, I suck at this and, and this is going to be rubbish and it doesn't sound right yet. And I still know that all of the all the songs I wrote before went through that phase where they didn't sound right yet because they weren't finished because <laughs> I hadn't done it yet. Yeah. But I still have that weird feeling. But at least now I can go, but I have done this before successfully. And again, I mean success by completion of song. I have done it before. I probably will do it again kind of feeling. But it takes a while. It's just a repetition maybe. Make it more of a normal part of life. And, and for me, it, it's also been like just a changing of expectations. Like my expectations are not that as soon as I sit down with the guitar, I should be able to write an entire song, which is better than all of my previous songs. My expectation is that if I sit down with the guitar for half an hour, I'll come up with some musical idea. If I yeah. actually give myself the time to think about that lyrical idea I have and like 
let my brain properly mull it over and percolate it, then the idea of what the lyrics could be will start to come out. But the expectation is that I'll have to work on it. That's probably for the best. Yeah, yeah. And so I had a good question then. Come on, brain. What's I thinking? Songwriting, songs. This is a bit, these are the bits I delete. Um, <laughs> some people do um, unedited podcasts. I just think they've got balls of steel. I don't understand how you could possibly, possibly do that. It's going to sound shit. I wanted to ask about your podcast though. That's a cool thing to do as a band. How's it going? What's, what's that all about? I suppose it's, comes from um how do you promote an album when you can't do gigs and things and how do you yeah. connect with the people who like your songs and i think we're aware that in order for people to um commit their time to getting into our music we have to charm them into it a little bit <laughs> yes and maybe yes. that's maybe that's easier to do that's a, a nice way of putting it yeah come on guys come come and listen to our music if you give it a bit of time it'll be good um so you know we thought what can we do we don't really want to talk about ourselves we don't really want to talk about our own music too much because you know we will bore each other um so we decided that we would um you know, in this way of like spreading out what the process is, sp spreading it out around the floor so you can see inside it. It's like the these are the songs that maybe inspired one of our songs. Um, so we've mm. we've only put out one so far, and we've done done the next one. Um, I mean, we we both find it incredibly awkward, and it, it's not heavily edited, but there are occasional bits where it goes mm. like this. Mm. Uh, uh, what was I trying to say? Which I have cut out. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, if me and Peter relax, then and we just get talking to each other about music, then it can be quite amusing. And certainly, when I was listening back to the first episode on us editing it, I found myself laughing. It's like, oh well, maybe. Mm. If you're ready to be charmed by me and Peter, you would might find this quite entertaining. Um, <laughs> yeah. And if no one listens to it, that's fine. It, but at least we've, <laughs> you know, found one other way to, to to get out there and tell people we've got a new album coming out. You know, um, which is what a certain yeah. certain amount of my life is geared around at the moment. And then after the after yes, the album comes out, I'll stop thinking about that. Yeah, there's a lot, yeah. Because even even with labels and things involved, there's still a lot that bands can be doing to charm people into checking out their stuff. So I think that's a good way. It's a, it's a nice nerdy way. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely for the nerds. Most of what we do is for the nerds. Um, we are nerds. I'm a nerd. I love being a nerd. Yeah, and you just embrace it. Um, I'd feel like we were letting down Matt and Ollie at the label if we you know, didn't seriously do the work to tell people that the record is out that there are lots of things that they can do um but if we don't help by making a bit of interesting visual content um and you know doing all these like little bits and pieces which aren't too arduous it's basically us just saying hey here i am talking about things and we have a new album coming out didn't you know um that's not an arduous task that's not like a real job. No. <laughs> um, if that's our duty, it's an entirely acceptable amount of duty. Yeah. I love doing lots of different things around music because I love making it and I'd like to make even more of it. But then I'm interested in talking to people like you and other, other artists and talking to other artists in front of people who might find it to be interesting or inspiring or, you know, just to see that we don't find it particularly easy, that we all have our you know, moments of anxiety and sadness and fear and self-loathing and all of that normal human stuff. Because I think showing people they're not alone is really important. And so, yeah, I, I like all that stuff. And I just, I like 
making things. And yeah, if, if everything was just based on how well my last album did, then it would be a pretty weird and sad existence because you can't quantify that anyway. It would be like one sort of pinpoint of light every 18 months or fewer. And that's just not enough. That's just not sensible. So as a human person, I need more than that. Yeah. And you can sometimes see that happening with with bands at all sorts of levels where their well-being is based on a reaction to a, a record they've done. And, and th- that's not a good place to be. Um, no. Terrible. No, because the bad reviews always stick more anyway. It's just a universal truth. You will always remember the shitty Facebook comment, not the one the, the person who emailed you said that a song changed their life. No offence to that person. Please continue to send those messages to the artists you love. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, it's kind of, tra- kind of tragic that that is the, the universal truth of it, but it, it kind of is, mm. unfortunately. The one that you like, yeah. you find yourself brooding about maybe not even thinking about it in a conscious way. It's like, why, why am I in a bad mood? I'm in a bad mood about that YouTube comment. Really? Oh, I am. I am. <laughs> yeah. I am. Ah, calm down. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> it just takes up too much space. I woke up the other morning. I don't use the word literally, so actually I'm not going to because it's a crap word. I woke up the other morning and the first thing I thought was about this woman who had said, and it, it really stung more than it was a woman, she had said in in response to a Facebook ad for my latest music video that says something like, because there was a review, right, that said, this is the missing link between Gary Newman and early Goldfrap. Now that's a high compliment to me. That's amazing. I didn't write that about myself. Someone else wrote it and I thought, that's cool. I love that. That's cool, right? So that's gone into a Facebook ad. Is this the missing link between blah, 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 blah? Of course, when you ask people a question and they don't know you yet, <laughs> They love telling you that you're wrong. So this woman just popped up and she wasn't even particularly mean. And she's getting even more of my energy now because I'm telling you for some reason. And she said, I'm sure you'd like to think so. (laughs) I was just like, of course I'd like to think so. But I didn't make it up about myself. And also, what's the point of you saying that? And then I woke up the next morning thinking about her and I thought, what is life? This is so silly. It gets in your brain. It's the uh, the terror. Silly. What a waste of time. The terror of the bottom half of the internet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then, of course, the point is, if you're reaching people who are able to be casually cruel to you, it means that you're reaching more and more people. And that is good generally. But it still is no fun. And of course, there's no one else to read that comment. Of course, I'm going to see it. I'm not searching it out. I'm not doing a Google search for my name and who slagged me off recently. Of course you're going to read it. But anyway, I digress. Google (laughs) field music are rubbish in quotation marks. (laughs) Is that on your to-do list for later on? I'll do that after the album's come out. (laughs) Yes. That's that's probably the most, uh, most appropriate time. Let's just get straight in there. I'd love to know how you feel about the internet these days as you started your band at a time when things were very different as did I um and what's your current relationship with smartphones um I mean having been stuck in the house with my own children for quite a quite a lot of the last year I've definitely checked Mm. my phone too much I mean I feel like I've come to an arrangement with social media um Mm. Twitter's good for news. It's good for seeing what clever people say about things, which I'm I'm interested in. I'm interested in what clever, mm. entertaining people say about things. Um, mm-hmm. And as a middle-aged man with lots of opinions, Twitter's the perfect platform for me. <laughs> and as long as I That's don't true. take as long as I don't <laughs> take that too seriously and accept that. <laughs> I'm a middle-aged man with opinions. Um, being able to put them on Twitter in a kind of constant stream of consciousness. Um, it is maybe maybe a relief for me. Um, there have been times when I've found that quite 
the, you know, the discourse on Twitter quite upset. And then sometimes you step into mm. someone else's Twitter world and it's like, oh, this is, this is awful. But um, my Twitter feed is carefully curated to mostly include clever people talking in depth about things that are interesting. Not always things that I agree with, but, you know. Yeah. Intelligent people with intelligent arguments or funny people with who say daft things. Mm. Um, yeah. In a way, it's like accepting that it's only nice if it's your bubble. And when you step outside the bubble and see some areas of existence which are despicable, then it's upsetting. You know, if I ever go on this, mm. end up on a, a Sunderland Echo Facebook post and see the comments underneath, you know, my my thoughts turn quite dark. So I try and, try and avoid that. Um, yeah. There's a difference between having your views challenged in a healthy and useful way and stepping into some dystopian world of people who are just grim. For me, it's not about, like you're saying, it's not creating a, a, a bubble that's that only echoes exactly what you think. It's just staying away from the awful parts of humanity to protect your mental health. That's what I, that's how I view it. Yeah. You, you want to amplify the goodness in the world. You want to amplify a, a better kind of discourse and steer clear of the rest. Otherwise it'll drive you bonkers. That, that's, that's how I feel about it at the moment. That's, that's my, my mm. current truce. Um, mm. But as you say, like in, career-wise you know we started at a very different time um pre pre myspace even so you know we, we sometimes have to like scrabble to catch up and i can't one of the principles again that we probably started with is like you have to not assume that other people are that different from you yeah but actually i i mostly don't consume my music by streaming i'm not a record collector i like I like music, but I'm not bothered about like which edition it is. I'm not bothered about what color the vinyl is. I, I want the music. Um, yeah. So I've had to expand that and think about how other people consume their music and not make it an, an ethical thing. It's just like, this is how it works for someone. That's fine. Yeah. Just because that's yeah. not how, I, I mean, I still... I still buy CDs. Lots of people do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's not just you. Still, it's still a lot of, in terms of actual like quantity sold, CD is still outsells vinyl. It's just that the value of it isn't isn't as much. Um, mm -hmm. But like accepting that other people, especially people who are really interested in new music, they they might do it in a different way, and that's another strange one for me because actually like. There's not a great deal of new music that I'm interested in. So we're trying to appeal to people who are also interested in a lot of new music, which is like, ah, that doesn't make sense to me. Um, so yeah, there's a, a, an accommodation has to happen in my brain of other people don't do this in exactly the same way as me. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm not, not going to make a judgment on it. You, uh, you accommodate them and make sure that like if they are ready to enjoy our music you find a way for them to do it um yeah 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 because ultimately we make it so people can hear it as we were talking about earlier yeah yeah so if you want to stream it <laughs> that's what it's for fine it's like hey yeah. may maybe you don't get the liner notes or the lyrics or the artwork in a full way but if you, you get the music fine and hmm. One of the things that I like about pop music is that it does have this egalitarian thing. You, you don't have to spend a lot of money in order to get exactly the artwork, exactly the piece of art. Mm. The piece of art is that set of songs mm -hmm. in, recorded in this way. Mm -hmm. It's a cheap thing to have. It's not elitist at all. Yeah. And I, I like that romantically. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. want want that to be maintained really. So we we probably won't do special editions where you get the real thing 
if you spend 400 quid, I want you to be able to get the mm. real thing for, for a tenner, the real piece of art. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, th- funnily enough, when you, were, when you were talking before, I was thinking about it in terms of like the democratization of listening in some way. Because when iTunes came along and you could preview a song, you could preview it before you bought it. I don't, I don't buy stuff off iTunes, so I don't know if it's still the same now, but I think it's like 20 or 30 seconds of a preview of a song. And I just thought, that's sort of ridiculous. Like, I want to hear the whole song. And then if I want the song, I'll buy the song. So then when Bandcamp came along and I started releasing my own music, 2009, 10, um, I loved the fact that you could preview the whole thing. So you could stream the whole song, see if you liked it. And if you really like it, you'll buy it. And, you know, or if you really like it and you want to own it, you'll buy it. And if you just really like it, maybe you'll stream it again. And that's fine because not everyone can afford to buy music and not everyone need, feels the need to own things. So I'm with you on that, that there's all these different ways that people will want to engage with your music. And I just want to invite that and, and welcome that in all the ways. And and I suppose as long as there's enough people who are able to and want to buy the vinyl and the CD and stuff and come to the shows and things, then bands can continue. That's fine. I think that works out perfectly fine. Um, I'm not leading you down an ethical debate about streaming particularly, but I have my own views on it, but this is a conversation with you. So I'm not going to use this as my own, you know, soapbox thing. The the economics of it to me seem skewed. It mm. The technology has moved a lot faster than legislation. Mm. Um, and intellectual property is entirely dependent on legislation. The idea of intellectual property only exists because mm. of legislation. Um, and yeah, we, we, so we're in this kind of like wild west period where the the parties who have the most power and the most money are able to set the terms. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm glad people like Tom Gray are out there saying it's not quite right mm. and pushing for it to be, to be looked at. I, I'm, you know, I'm really interested to see what rec- recommendations come out of the, uh, yeah. the DCMS stream and inquiry. It'll be really fascinating. And whether it's, possible to turn that into legislation I, I, I don't know I, I'm I'm interested I I suppose I had thought that as the economies of scale changed it would naturally move towards something that's more equitable mm. that doesn't seem to be happening mm. um because I think there are fundamental problems in the model I mean one of which is if you were like my parents casual listeners like music didn't buy a lot of records in a year you might have bought three albums mm. and spent 25 pounds 30 pounds doing it now the way to be a casual music listener is to spend 120 pounds a year for all music that's ever made <laughs> um mm-hmm. yeah in a way, they are getting the most value from the most casual music listeners. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe that's just how it is now. But it certainly like points to an imbalance between someone's interest in music and the value transfer that happens. Yeah. That's such a... Yeah, that's such a good way of putting it. And I'm just really keen to make a point that from my perspective, it's not, and it's never about shaming the consumer because the consumer is being offered this amazing thing. And I'm, I'm sure you think you would yeah. agree. Yeah, they're being offered this amazing thing. I have seen a bit of this sort of shaming of people like you should be buying records, you should be this and that. I don't, I don't think that. I think if, if you want to have vinyl and you want to have CDs and you want to directly support artists, then please do. Of course, of course, please do that. But people who are paying for a service that gives them all this amazing stuff, they're, they're paying for it, aren't they? What's the problem? It's not their fault that they're offered this thing that doesn't support the musicians. That's the fault of the company concerned. So Yeah, it's, it's, it's a problem with the model. Like yeah. if it works for you to listen like mm. through your phone into your hi-fi or your laptop or whatever you know if that works for you 
This mm. is amazing, amazing yeah. time to spend 120 quid a year and have all of this music available yeah. to you. It's the fact that the underlying economics of that don't attribute the rewards it, it, mm. how you might imagine. It's nothing to do with the consumer at, at all. No. And all the streaming services essentially offer the same deal. So it's not even like your consumer choice within that makes a huge difference. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know where to go from here, but yes, I agree with you. <laughs> segue into um, awkward We've segue. We've solved it all. We've solved it all now. <laughs> <laughs> awkward segue to which three pieces of your own work would you recommend people listen to if they've never heard of you before today? This is a really tricky one because it really depends on what you're into. If you like rock music, you should listen to our album Measure. If you like strange orchestral arty music, you should listen to Tones of Town or Plum first. If you're coming from a proggy perspective, Plum is definitely the one. If you love Hall and Oates, you should listen to Common Time first. <laughs> I've, I've, I think because we've like covered a few different areas, it really depends on what, where where you are coming from as a listener. Mm. And I and I hear it all the time from like, oh, the one that I really care about is Plum, and I listen to it straight after I listen to King Crimson, and yes. It's like, oh, well, right. yeah, of course, of, of course, that's the one that makes sense in that context. Um, like, if I was going to say this is what we sound like, I would say the album Open Here covers the most bases and has a flow which I like. Mm. And maybe Tones of Town from 2007 is the one where it's like, we we stumbled across what was unique about what we do properly for the first time and made it work. Mm. Um, and outside of that, yeah, like it's, I can't, I can't, I can't go there. <laughs> so what's the new record then? If, if, if those other ones are, you know, there's, there's the prog one, there's the rock one, there's the Hall and Oates one. What's the new one? I, d I don't have a perspective to say. We, we, we started as one thing and then became another thing. So like when we started recording, mm. we we basically had this idea that we were going to do like our like British blues boom album. Mm. So we both, the first music we got into was free. And Led Zeppelin, Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac, that, that music. Mm. And that's how we learned to play. Mm-hmm those influences haven't always come through in what we've done because because we've stretched out in all these different directions um but yeah when we start it's like yeah we're going to do a record that's like free mm. and it's going to be easy to play because we've done two albums in a row that are, were difficult to play and then it started to turn into something else and yeah. now i don't know what it is yeah. and i don't know whether it's like half free and half whatever else we ended up doing yeah. and i think that the um lockdown just exacerbated that because the idea of us just getting together in the studio and like rocking out in this simple way was mm. no no longer available to us no of course not i didn't answer that question I'm no sorry. i know i know you didn't but you talked anyway so that's good that's what podcasts are <laughs> well like i say i'm, I'm a middle-aged opinionated man I'm, i've got opinions about all sorts of things they don't always make sense but i've got a lot of opinions and you've just got nowhere to share them <laughs> as a middle-aged uh man with opinions there's nowhere to say things anymore i've basically been cancelled no one wants to hear my opinions you've been silenced <laughs> it's terrible i feel so hard done by i read a brilliant thing today where someone pointed out that you can't be silenced if you haven't shut up for a while yet <laughs> <laughs> that could be my motto <laughs> finally then i would just like to say thank you so much for talking to me i'm really excited to hear the fullness of your new album and I think everyone should go and get it immediately. I should send it to you right now. Oh, if you like, I'll send you mine as well. I'll do that. That would be great. Cool. Yeah. Well, it's really been a pleasure <laughs> to talk to you. And Thank you. Not surprising to me that we would have so many shared experiences. Oh, okay. Uh, but always nice to realise that as well.
Just brilliant. Thank you so much to David for talking to me. And I hope you're in the mood now to dive into the wonderful world of field music. Remember, their new album Flat White Moon is out very, very soon and you can pre-order your copy right now. As always, I have made a deluxe show notes page on my website at penfriend.rocks forward slash David B with videos and links and all that good stuff. Drop in and you can grab a couple of free Pen Friend songs as well. If you got something from this episode, I would love to hear about it. This 12 week season is drawing to a close, as I said, which is a good time to think about where to go with the next batch of conversations. So hearing about what you're enjoying the most is really useful. And hey, if you just want to pay the show a compliment, the best place for that is the review section of Apple Podcasts. Thanks. My new album, Exotic Monsters, is coming out in just over six weeks and is up against both Gary Newman and Griff Reese in the race for the top spot. So if you'd like to secure your copy on limited edition vinyl, CD, cassette or download, the link is penfriend.rocks forward slash new album. In all seriousness, because of the support of brilliant, independently minded and very clever music fans, my record is already halfway to getting in the UK top 40, which is pretty incredible since I'm releasing it on my own from this attic room. So thanks to all who have already jumped on board the Penfriend train, and if you'd like to join us, there's plenty of space for you as well. Thank you again to Louisa Mead for sponsoring this episode, and to my beloved correspondents for powering the making of my new album and more. Thank you from the bottom of my heart to you for listening, and I'll be back next Wednesday with the final episode of this 12-week stretch, so I hope to catch you then. Take good care. <laughs>